I'm Dr. David Kirtley of Helion Energy. I want to start and thank my co-authors, Brian Campbell, Andrew Hine, Richard Milroy, Chris Peel, Rachel Ryan, and George Vatrebeck, and the rest of the Helion team. Uh, this work today, we're going to be talking about our sixth fusion prototype called Trenta, which is a pulsed magneto inertial fusion compression prototype. Specifically, we'll be discussing the vacuum vessel, diverter design, and then results of 16 months of operation in 2020. Uh, so today we'll uh, briefly talk about the advantages of pulsed non-ignition magneto-inertial fusion, dig in a little deeper to field reverse configuration plasmas, an overview of the Trenta program itself, uh, and then uh, a deeper dive into the diverter, the materials, the magnetic topology, vacuum system design, and then uh, some wear analysis and conclusions of this work and discussion of ongoing uh, next steps. So our approach to fusion um, uses pulsed non-ignition MIF, where we take a field reverse configuration and then compress it to high temperatures, to thermonuclear conditions. Uh, some of the key benefits here that are unique among fusion, um, the, the, the material boundary, the magnetic radius, is significantly larger than the gyro orbits at all times. Um, so we have complete vacuum boundaries. So no plasma material uh, interface during the high temperature compression. Diverter is a different story. We'll get to that. Um, with pulsed magnetic compression, uh, we've been able to show that you can do adiabatic compression, two high temperatures at very high efficiencies, leading to lower gain requirements for fusion. Pulsed magnetic systems are fundamentally non-destructive uh, with theoretical repetition rates much greater than one hertz, allowing you to minimize the scale of the system, therefore build systems faster uh, and lower capital requirements and, and get to fusion sooner. And then most importantly, an inductive compression scheme, especially pulsed inductive compression, allows direct energy conversion through just MHD conversion. Uh, and uh, we've been able to show that you can, in fact, do this through a compression and expansion cycle that extracts particle uh, energy directly. However, some of the key challenges, while direct energy recovery allows you to use alternate fuels, those have increased ion temperature requirements and equilibration requirements, both of which need to be satisfied. We've showed confinement now well over five KeV temperatures and that our scaling, uh, even dating back to the large S experiment program holds. However, we have to continue to demonstrate that beyond 10 KeV and higher, that remains to be done. First wall design, um, fundamental to these system designs is the limit of the first wall. Um, we want solid first walls in all FRC systems. And what that fundamentally means is a power loading of X-ray and neutron radiation of less than 10 megawatts per square meter. However, even that, for those who study the field, know that that's a really tough and demanding requirement that we're pushing boundaries on. We'll talk about that today, too. Um, and then pulse, magne pulse magnets in a neutron environment require replacement. Um, and so that replacement cycle and the economics of that and the mechanics of that um, are work to be done. Finally, diverter. Um, uh, at the, at the exit of one of these pulse cycles that we'll talk about, um, the remaining plasma does expand, translate into a diverter, um, in which case we actually need to cool it, expand it, and deal with it. So like all fusion diverters, tokamak or otherwise, um, and MFE and MIF and MTF systems, um, the material science challenges, the magnetic design is actually a, a large challenge. So that's the, the main focus of this work today. So a quick overview on field reverse configurations. Um, so for those of you not familiar with an FRC, uh, this configuration of plasma has been studied extensively. An FRC shown here is a cylindrical top magnetic topology. Um, fundamentally, they're closed field, self-organized compact toroids. What that ends up being for an FRC, which is a high pressure device, is beta very close to one, the average beta condition of an FRC. Um, and so that allows you to do a couple of really key things. One, you know, at any time from an external magnetic field measurement, you know the internal plasma pressure and you can know the internal plasma profile. That's pretty critical. FRC profiles, unlike most uh, fusion plasmas, are uniform or close to uniform um, and have been studied extensively. Uh, pressure balance, because beta is, is near one, uh, you have always have for an external magnetic field measurement as well as an applied field, you know with high certainty what the internal density and total temperature are. This becomes a pretty critical diagnostic for us. You'll see this throughout um, where external magnetic field measurements and magnetic flux measurements allow us to know, uh, and, and interferometry measurements allow us to know temperature, total temperature. Um, 
ex measuring ion and electron temperature separately requires separate diagnostics that we'll talk about. And finally, this is the most in important. The average beta relationship gives us an axial pressure balance as well. Um, we can talk, uh, I would direct you to the literature for that. Um, but that shows us very clearly the relationship of, of the length to the radius as well for any external compression field. So this then allows us to design a complete system from, from, from first principles that will get to full thermonuclear conditions using an FRC. Um, so some of the key relationships are shown here uh, on fundamental FRC scaling relationships. So shown are the energy confinement uh, times and, and particle confinement times. This is uh, derivations of lower hybrid drift, R squared over rho i scaling. Um, but what that has enabled us to do now is with empirical relationships built up over a history of, of programs by us and others, put together um, pretty well-defined, uh, called the LSX scaling, um, and then the modified LSX scaling. Um, and we'll show today how at higher temperature we've been able to extend that, but um, shown some deviations from that as well. Um, also critical for amount of trapped poloidal flux, you have a given amount of external field and radius for a given compressed plasma. Using these relationships and adiabatic compression, uh, you can see on the right here our final compression relationships. So for a given magnetic field, an, uh, an initial magnetic field and then a peak compression magnetic field, we can then a priori design a system for uh, ion electron temperatures as well as um, densities required to get to fusion conditions. The other key requirement for field reverse configurations is stability. Fundamentally, FRCs are MHD unstable to the tilt instability. Uh, this is a major, uh, a, a major instability that, that should drive total confinement of these systems. It has been shown by us, others, uh, as well as others, and starting with the large S experiments program references shown here, that uh, FRC tilt instability is stabilized to an extent by the kinetic motion of the ions within the plasma itself. Uh, kinetic stability as well as hole stability have both been theorized, and then we have an empirical scaling that's well proven over a number of experiments that show that as long as you are at an S star over E, um, uh, which is a ratio of the ion gyro ra radius to the elongation of the plasma of less than five, that these uh, systems are in total stabilized against the tilt stability. This enables us to build systems that have a theoretical stability limit uh, in MHD stability in the microseconds or nanosecond level, um, but actually extend them to hundreds of microseconds or milliseconds. The, uh, this, in addition to the adiabatic scaling relationships, sets the whole parameter space of what we design a fusion system using FRC compression. The other key uh, component to this is after an FRC is compressed, uh, uh, the uh, two fusion conditions. In this case, we'll be talking about an excess of 8 keV uh, total temperature and ion temperature. Uh, these plasmas, we have to actually expand them and exhaust them. And that's where some of the key physics and engineering of these systems comes into play. Um, so we've designed these diverters on, the, on either axial end of our system to be able to hand up to, uh, handle up to 100 kilojoule plasmas per pulse. Um, with expecting of ions in the 10 keV deuterium and helium ions, um, as well as a limited number of the pulse, uh, pulse fusion products. So this is MeV alphas, protons, deuterons, and tritons. Uh, these end up being very critical design parameters, uh, as you might imagine. The last real key requirement, and this has been studied by us as well as others, and there's some references attached, um, is electron thermal conduction. Uh, like all fusion plasmas, electrons are the primary thermal loss mechanism. And in the diverter, uh, we fundamentally have to, to have to try to minimize that while actually uh, having materials that can, that can take the, bomb, the plasma bombardment of both the low temperature plasma ions and most importantly, the fusion products. Um, so we designed these systems uh, fundamentally to be below 10, uh, 10 megawatts per square meter as a key limit. Uh, we believe that's actually also really challenging to do. So we focus on systems that are five megawatts per square meter and lower. Um, and then the approach that we've taken here, we have several on the Trenta system. What we're describing today is a cylindrical cusp geometry. Um, I think this is, this is similar to a traditional X uh, diverter topology, um, where here we actually, uh, after a post expansion, we compress, we have a, a, a mirror geometry to high field, then we then cusp and expand that uh, out to the walls. In this case, uh, specifically, the, the data shown here is a dielectric wall, interestingly enough. The dielectric can still set up a sheath. That sheath will then limit thermal conduction to the wall. Uh, this was shown by others. We've been able to show this now at scale with at thermonuclear conditions. Um, 
Um, the other part to this is in the diverter. Uh, this work has been looked at extensively by others, some in our research staff as well, or some of the pioneers here. Um, but you can actually stabilize the FRC against um, its, its next most serious instability, which is an N equal to rotational instability. Um, in all the data we're going to be showing here, uh, there was no uh, actual uh, edge biasing or other stability mitigation. Um, this is, and so these plasmas were terminated, uh, not on a tilt instability time scale, but on a rotational instability growth. Um, uh, there is no uh, addition of any kind of stabilizing system in what we're showing here today. Overview of the Trent Experimental Program. Uh, what we did here, what we aim to do, and then we're successfully able to do, is uh, take two large scale, two meter scale FRCs, accelerate two of those two meter scale FRCs towards each other to a central compression region, merge them at supersonic compression and merging, references are attached, and then compress those to high, uh, high temperature. Um, here over, over eight, over five, well over five keV total temperature. Um, the goal of this program is to get even hotter than that. Um, and uh, as well as keep diverter loads on those pulse systems less than five kilojoules per meter squared. So expand those plasmas to large scale diverters that you can see here in these pictures. We're not gonna dig in too deep into uh, diagnostics. There's a whole host of plasma diagnostics on this system ranging from magnetic interferometer, uh, uh, um, infrared interferometers, Bremster lung radiation, X-ray spectrometers, and a whole host as you can see here of neutron diagnostics. We're gonna to touch just on the operation of this system. Um, this is data through the end of 2020 from operating from as low as three Tesla compression all the way up to uh, above seven Tesla compression. Again, this is our Mark I diverter. So that, that is a, a cylindrical cusp geometry. All the lifetime of these plasmas are limited, uh, limited by the onset of the N equal two rotation. Um, and then most importantly, little to zero uh, uh, observance of any destructive tilt. Um, you can see in the bottom left here the scaling relationships of expected confinement lifetime, um, and this is uh, particle lifetime and magnetic flux lifetime. You have to be a little bit careful here. Magnetic flux is not energy explicitly, but generally we consider them relatively close to each other for these high beta plasmas. Um, and so the relationship sh shown here is from Alan Hoffman and, and, and the, the LSX team, and then extended beyond that in their follow-on programs. Um, and what you can see here is then a comparison of our measured um, flux lifetimes. We also have particle lifetimes, but here I'm showing the flux lifetimes of the Trenta system. Uh, these results, um, we showed that lifetimes uh, at low temperatures um, that were on the LSX time scale within error bars. But interestingly enough, um, as we went to higher temperatures and lower densities, um, those relationships, we actually exceeded the LSX types uh, lifetime flux and energy confinement times by over a factor of four. Um, and you can see the data here of that increasing trend as we increase in total plasma temperature um, in the data shown here up to uh, over 8,500 electron volts of total plasma temperature. The other interesting thing that, that FRCs have that are unique is because you have a pulse systems where the ion and e uh, electron equilibration times, uh, the operation of the machine is less the ion, than the ion ele electron equilibration time, you can actually have an ion and electron temperature um, a gradient within this system. Um, and, and this we were able to observe here actually more than any system previous um, where typical systems have shown from zero to maybe five times um, a, a ratio of ions uh, to electrons. Here we exceeded 10 times the ions to the electrons with electrons in some of these systems well exceeding one keV electron temperature and ions exceeding a, a eight keV ion temperature. Um, and these are not, uh, and these are, these are um, emerged compress um, a, a, a static system. We're not talking about uh, emerging or any kind of collisional temperature uh, uh, situation that you may have in, in other merging or, or particle beam type systems. Um, error bars here are represented in terms of uh, understanding of the magnetic topology as well as calibration of those X-ray diagnostics for the electron temperature. So getting to some of the key engineering requirements of these systems, these are a little bit different than other plasma systems. We, uh, we talk about a sweet spot in between uh, magnetic fusion systems um, and, and traditional inertial fusion systems with pre-compressed neutral densities in the one to 100 millitor territory. That's at, at obviously at room temperature. Um, gas and then compressed plasma densities uh, and the, the low, uh, say, few Tesla systems, 10 to the 21, all the way up to 10 to the 24 peak compression densities. 
Um, and what that means is because our neutral density is in the millitor and tens of millitor territory, our background pressures can be actually quite a bit higher before impurities start to have an issue. We don't see impurity-driven um, losses in, for electron temperature, for instance, all the way up to the 10 to the minus 4 territory of back tor background gas. Um, and so, so a lot of the impurities and leak rate things uh, uh, we can ignore, which means we get to move to elastomer seals. However, elastomer seals obviously in a high temperature plasma environment have a lot of challenges. Um, so what we've been able to show here is we can build systems that have a quartz shadow shield interface on every, um, uh, every elastomer high temperature gasket. And then we dif differentially pump the backside of those gaskets to prevent again, further leaks or any kind of, of interaction with any outside uh, leakage. Um, and, then, and then finally, uh, by building these systems as, remote, as robustly as, as they were, we are able to actually pump down these systems with a number of these seals uh, and then stay under vacuum for 16 months straight uh, and do uh, several thousand, uh, almost up to 10,000 operations of this system. The last thing I want to say is that not all of our, our, our gaskets have this, but everywhere we can, we add ele electromagnetic shield, but essentially have an axial magnetic field that, that, that means that any low temperature electrons um, that are magnetized, that actually escape, uh, that, that are getting near the wall, uh, we can actually keep those out of those gaskets. In previous systems, we have seen ion and plasma bombardment of seals and have seen contamination from them. In this machine, we watched with the monochromators um, uh, you know, on the previous slide and didn't see any actually uh, impurity-driven uh, 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 impurity cooling or radiation losses from these seals. Um, the verter itself, there's a lot of key requirements in these systems. Um, because we have some pulsed magnetic fields, a lot, we have to use a lot more dielectric materials than, are used, than people are used to. Um, so here we're, we're showing um, a cylindrical silica geometry um, and then an end geometry of usually a high Z um, early experimental work used to stainless, but then we moved to a high Z molybdenum and have looked at tungsten as well on those systems. Um, again, the key here is a cusp design and a magnetic cusp you can see here, which is an MHD, a hybrid pick code, um, where we have an MHD simulation overlaid with particles um, that are, that are, are tracked within that MHD fluid si simulation. And we watch the low temperature plasma as it evolves and bombards the wall um, as it expands and cools. However, the high temperature, uh, particularly the fusion products, are not confined by that cusp and they uh, expand and hit the wall. Um, and so in this system, we are observing this, we are looking at the damage, we are measuring through probes um, what that damage was of this system. Uh, and what that enabled us to do is look at uh, the evolution of these materials. So uh, this high energy pulse, five kilojoules per meter squared, still does um, uh, ablate some material. So we have quartz that's ablated from uh, windows as well as from the dielectric material, um, and then redeposits. And so we're able to measure that ablation and measure that redeposition over time. Um, for the operation of tens of thousands of pulses, this wasn't a problem. Um, but what we imagine is that actually over millions and billions of operations that, that we need to address this. So in conclusion, our sixth prototype, Trenta, demonstrated that we can build a repeatable, sustainable, uh, greater than 5 keV plasmas um, and operate in a, a, a cylindrical cusp diverter. Um, so far, that diverter cusp design, um, even with a diamagnetic boundary, it's provided sufficient thermal conduction and mitigation of any losses for the low temperature plasma. Um, quartz erosion and the silica erosion is ongoing, but minor um, and, and, and would be a life limiter for a long, long-term operation of one of these systems. Future work is gonna require um, higher field magnetic shielding, which we're implementing right now, um, and uh, uh, with a focus on getting lifetime and more importantly, handling the MEV fusion products. So I wanna thank the funders for this work. Um, this work was primarily funded through private investors, Mithril Capital, Capricorn, and others. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, telling you more about the work being done on Trenton in the future.